Uh, I'm going to try to flesh out some of the things that Dr. Albrigo talked about and maybe give some explanation based on grower observations, not my own, for uh, some of the phenomena that he mentioned, the differences in fruit drop between growth. And I'm going to center my uh, comments on root health. And specifically, are there issues related to root health, loss of root health that uh, was cited that we can manage? How actively can we take uh, a hold of this situation we're in? Uh, just to reiterate, I'm uh, probably repeating a lot of what was already said, but I think it bears repeating, is that there was fruit drop this year at an unprecedented level. And you have to consider that the incidence of HLB in the state is increasing, ever in increasing, un you know, unstop unrelentingly, unrelentingly uh, and, and toward 100%. And you can see the evidence of that in the youngest growth and not so well in the older growths, but I think if you look closely enough, you'll see that symptoms are pretty well distributed uh, throughout groves now, and you can't say that every grove is 100%. It depends on the area of the state, but that many are approaching that. And you've heard about the statewide fruit drop and the estimates of that of uh, USDA and at the unprecedented uh, levels of drop on all the varieties. And most of that HLB, or most of that fruit drop, I think uh, we can agree is due to HLB, although there were other factors that were cited by uh, Dr. Albrigo. And I agree, you, you know, you can't attribute it anything to one single factor. But what has changed is that the incidence of HLB is increasing all the time. So I'm going to talk more about uh, why, why HLB affected trees drop fruit. I'll probably repeat a lot of what was said and what was questioned about or answered about. And then why is the fruit drop greater than in past seasons? And I'm going to talk about carbohydrates. So I'm kind of uh, zeroing in on one of these factors that has been mentioned and tell you that uh, two months before fruit mature, past, uh, mat past maturity test, carbohydrates start moving from leaves to fruit. This is the normal course of events. But we know that with modeling in leaves that occurs in about August with hamlins and, and, and all varieties for that matter, that that's a reflection of the carbohydrate dysfunction in the leaf. That is, starch accumulates in chloroplasts, disrupts chloroplasts, the chloroplasts break. And this uh, modeling, this very distinctive symptom is a symptom of that backing up, if you will, of carbohydrate in the chloroplasts. In addition to that, the pathway to uh, the fruit from the leaf is disrupted. You have callose formation in that pathway. It's stopped up, if you will. That carbohydrate does not move efficiently as sucrose to the fruit. And that fruit doesn't reach the destination. And the evidence of that is this uh, stem end breakdown that I'm going to call a sign of carbohydrate deficiency. That's wherein the uh, fruit is fully formed, even fully sized, and it falls on the ground, and this is due to a lack of carbohydrate delivery to the destination, the fruit. And the evidence for that is this breakdown at the stem end. And it's not just a small uh, breakdown of the abscission zone, it's a fairly large disruption or breakdown of that tissue, and it's not unlike some years that I've seen with hamlins, when, they over, when they're heavily bearing and you have very cloudy conditions in uh, August, September, you can see whole clusters of fruit aborting on trees in the past years when you've had these very cloudy conditions and very heavy crops on hamlin. I use that as my, uh, my comparison where carbohydrate allocation is not disrupted but just deficient in its delivery to these clusters of fruit on very heavily bearing hamlets. So this is not uh, unprecedented, this kind of breakdown in my, uh, in my view, in my uh, experience. So this drop is statewide. It's not local, it's statewide. It's not varietal specific, it's statewide. And, and, and all the varieties that uh, Dr. Albrigo cited statistics for. Well, what we know now about this bacterium and how it works in the tree that we didn't know even a year ago, is that the bacterium, although introduced, transmitted by the psyllid, very quickly goes down as, as the phloem is bidirectional, it goes down to the roots. And that's uh, not quite what we expected, uh, predicted, but it follows the phloem flow in the tree. And the phloem goes uh, both ways. It's a bidirectional movement, and it goes in cycles uh, up and down in the tree, depending on sources and sinks in the tree and the time of the year and so forth. 
And even more unpredicted was not that the bacteria moves in the phloem and goes down, but that once it gets to the roots, it colonizes the roots very well. And furthermore, when it gets into the roots and colonizes, it moves quite readily uh, laterally in the root system, unlike about what you've heard in the shoot system, where you find it in one shoot and not in another. So quite uh, differently, the bacterium is not causing plugging in the root system. It's moving laterally. When you sample the root system, you can find it in different quadrants of the root system, even before you see any symptoms above the ground. Again, very unprecedented uh, way of looking at this uh, bacterial colonization is that uh, it seems that though, as though when you look at the bacterial colonization process, it's more like from the ground up rather than from the top down. Yes, it's introduced from the top, but it's from the ground up now that the bacterium is multiplying, spreading in the tree, and then moving up into the shoot of the tree from below, not from above. Now, Phytophthora, the story that uh, we've talked about, the interaction of it, uh, we've had some uh, indication of for about the last year, year and a half, and we've discussed uh, how that might work. Uh, it, it simply uh, works in the same way that I would say diapreppies or uh, uh, burrowing nematode or, or any kind of other major disrupting uh, process in roots is that it predisposes to Phytophthora infection. And it breaks resistance to Phytophthora. So if you have a swingle citromolo type of resistance uh, to Phytophthora nicotiani, it's not operating anymore as this bacterium has colonized the root and, and, and broken it down, uh, broken down its defenses. So you would expect uh, Phytophthora infection, nematode infection, all these other uh, root damaging organisms to have more effect. And as Dr. Albrigo cited, uh, uh, extensively is that any kind of stress on that root system is exacerbated by this breakdown of the root's uh, ability to function by, by the HLB colonization process. So phytophthora populations are elevated, exacerbated by this uh, breakdown in resistance. And here's some evidence of that from the greenhouse, and then I'll go to the field. Uh, this is a, a pot experiment wherein they were artificially inoculated trees versus uh, uh, non-inoculated. So you could very uh, well track through time the infection process, the effect on Phytophthora in this case. So you have the light colored bars, that's the uninfected, and you have the dark colored bars. That's the uh, HLV inoculated at two, eight, and 14 months. And you see the dynamics of Phytophthora interaction, you know, the populations being a measurement of that in the soil. As, as changing with time. At, at first, there's no difference. With time, uh, as we see, HLV exacerbates or increases infection by Phytophthora in populations. And then finally, at the end of the day, end of this experiment, 14 months later, roots are starting to disappear in these pots. You measure this uh, as a loss of roots uh, pretty accurately in a pot experiment. And Phytophthora populations collapse. No roots, no Phytophthora. Phytophthora eats uh, the carbohydrates in the roots, just like the uh, HLB bacterium does. It's the same carbohydrate source. It's sucrose. Uh, they both key on the same sugar, but as you lose roots, you lose uh, Phytophthora. Phytophthora is a parasite, so it must have roots to uh, survive and, and continue to produce populations. So there's the pot experiment, and I I say pot experiments uh, can give you any kind of answer you want, but what you, when you go to the field and you look at the data from the field, I think you get the real story. And this is a, a data set that Syngenta has shared with us over the last number of years. It's a, it's a data set that's been developing for 25 years now plus, uh, and it's a data set that gives you a, a statewide perspective on what's happening with Phytophthora, but as an extension of that, a state, statewide assessment of what Phytophthora and root health are doing together, working together at like. And uh, the process is like this. Uh, for years and years, the uh, populations on average through all the samples, thousands of samples, census each year was somewhere around uh, five to 10 on average. That's below the threshold for wh when we say to treat. So it was a conservative estimate. 10 to 20 is where we uh, say start to consider treatment with this kind of a a survey result. But in 2010 and then in 2011, things changed dramatically. And we said, 
That's its interaction of Phytophthora with HLB infection. That led us to look at this root health issue. This is the canary in the mine shaft, as John Taylor, who shared this data, says. This led us to look at the infection process in roots and, and ask really uh, critical questions of what was going on there. Now look what happens in 2012. 2012 is the year that we see this uh, very large change in fruit drop uh, out there in the industry. We're also seeing a large change again in Phytophthora populations in relation to statewide uh, censusing of it. And uh, you would say maybe this is an indication, as we saw in the pot, uh, pot experiment, that root health and root uh, loss is occurring not just in some places, but in many places statewide, and that that root health loss is pretty, pretty large and pretty dramatically different than it was in 2011 statewide. Well, here's some in indication of what all that root loss is about. Uh, that root loss that we've measured is on the order of magnitude of 30% of, uh, on up. That's the base, 30% on up. So what kind of measurements of crop loss do we have statewide? Uh, unfortunately, not very many. But the ones that we have, fortunately, are, are ones that have been made over the last number of years. And this is data that uh, Davis Crop Management uh, shared with us, uh, very kindly shared with us that shows that these losses in a Swingle and Carrizo grove measured over years is of the order of magnitude in both cases, both rootstocks. Uh, in, in both cases, this order of magnitude of crop loss is over 30%. In fact, it approaches uh, even higher levels than that, 40%. Now, that is not good news. That, that's telling you that root loss and crop loss are associated with one another. That's not unprecedented. That's the way things work with Phytophthora nematodes, diaprepes, all other uh, root infecting, uh, root affecting type of syndromes lead to crop loss. So this crop loss is equated with the root loss that we've measured. If there's any good news here, and I like to be positive about things, I'm not always talking about crop loss and talking about the bad. The, the crop loss here, if you look at this data from 2009 to 2011, which again is the, the great thing about this data set is that this has been repeated on the same trees over the last three years, and now fourth year uh, by Robin Bryant, Magnolia uh, Consulting. They've gone back and censored these trees again and again to show that this crop loss is not increasing with time, at least up to 2011. So the good news is, is that these are well-managed groves in terms of nutrition, water, uh, silid management, I would say this is in the top 10% uh, uh, quartile or, uh, or a level of care in the state of Florida. So what it says is that investment in good horticultural management pays dividends in ter terms of not preventing this crop loss, but stabilizing this crop loss. So I think that's some very positive news about uh, what this crop loss assessment tells you. So just to summarize, you know, these order of magnitude of root losses and crop losses are similar. And I've, you know, we present data for uh, the crop loss. I did present it for the root loss because I think I presented it enough times before that, that this is not uh, news to you all. Phytophthora interacts with this uh, root infection and root loss and, and adds to it. It's not the primary amount of root loss that's due to Phytophthora infection. It's the added a root loss that occurs, the additional damage. So I want to change uh, gears here and talk about something that's come to our attention, again, through the observations of uh, Brian Belcher at Davis Management, and that is deep well water with high carbonates, bicarbonates, uh, well water with pH in excess of 7.5 and bicarbonate in excess of 100 ppm is interacting with groves that have HLB in different ways than the shallow well water that has low amounts of uh, carb bi bicarbonate in it. Now in ridge groves, you have also this history of dolomite application. This dolomite application follows that of where you have high levels of copper in the soil. When you follow the recommendations to keep the uh, uh, level of pH above 6.5, the set point recommended is 6.8, you have a dolomite history in, in ridge groves as well as this uh, history of of use of uh, high bicarbonate water. In these groves, uh, Brian Belcher observed with, with lesser uh, health, greater HLB damage, if you will, uh, not just incidents, but damage from the, the, uh, the HLB disease process, that when groves were above pH 6.5, 
and had this deep well water, high bicarbonates, either one or the other or both, that the HLB effect was greater than that where it was below this level where you had shallow well water and you had lesser uh, dolomite uh, levels or, or pH levels in the soil. So in cooperation with uh, Brian, we went out and looked at these groves and looked at their root health. First of all, you need to uh, follow that I, I didn't just set these uh, levels of pH and bicarbonates uh, arbitrarily. Again, I used their data that says when you look at the deep well water, it's, it's usually above 7.5 and, and 100 ppm bicarbonates. So looking at the condition of these groves, uh, these, are, these are groves that are matched in all ways. Uh, the, the day they were planted, the source of the uh, nursery trees, is that with the deep well water, you have a much higher expression of HLB decline as seen there as the classification from one to five. The higher the number, the greater the HLB effect and the greater the number of trees that are affected at that uh, different uh, rating level. And you see a much different picture between the deep well water and the shallow well water grove. This was the first uh, indication that uh, bicarbonates were an issue. When you look at the overall uh, decline uh, HLB incidence there, uh, all, all decline in each block, it was about twice that in the deep well water than it was in the shallow well water grove. Now, taking this one step further, not just looking at the well water, but looking at the dolomite history, uh, Brian more recently brought this to our attention, and that is in this block called McCann. In the northern half of the block, it was grapefruit when they bought it. They pulled out the trees, the old grapefruit, and, that, and then the dolomite treated that half the block, the north half of that block, and the, left, and the south half of that block being Valencia's was not dolomite treated. Uh, so it had a much different dolomite history than the top uh, part of the block did. And you see the pH range there as indicated by the color changes uh, is much different in the north and south halves of the block. Uh, they're treated uh, differently from the dolomite history, but then they were replanted at the same time in the north half, solid set, and the south half as, re as resets, resets in the old Valencia block. So looking at those Valencia trees now in a northern block, that was dolomite treated. You see this sort of condition of trees, and that's Brian standing in front there, give you an idea of how well the trees have grown over time, not just the recent time. And that is uh, the trees at pH 7.2 and above in the north half of the block are in a much different uh, state of health with regard to HLB effect than in the south half of the block with pH is 6.4. Notice that the trees uh, in the north half of the block have been harvested already. That's because the fruit drop was uh, at a very high level there and that in the south block, uh, part of the block, it's not. When you look at the root health on these trees, going back to that deep well water and shallow well water condition, you see a 25% difference in the amount of feeder roots on those trees. This is over and above the effect of HLB uh, in these two blocks because although they had different expressions of HLB. Essentially, the incidence in those two blocks was quite, quite the same. It was just the uh, expression of the disease effect on the trees. Phytophthora was not the story for this difference in uh, root health. It was apparently this bicarbonate condition in the well water. Well, this all led uh, us to uh, organize a tour to go to California that was sponsored by Syngenta to look at how they treat water how they look at pH control, pH problems, alkalinity problems, they call them, and how they treat those problems. Uh, and Kelly Morgan will talk more specifically about the treatments that you can use for these two conditions. I'll just simplify it to this. You have a situation where you have high bicarbonate, so you do water conditioning. In the case of Brian Belcher, he's, he's practiced enfuric acid injection into the well water head, into the irrigation line, if you will. Uh, the other is uh, pH control, and that can be controlled or, or, or lowered. pH can be lowered by uh, something like a, a coated or prilled sulfur, like Tiger 90, and that added to soil will drop the pH. This is some data that Larry Duncan shared with us, and it's where he added Tiger 90 two years ago, and he sees with that level of amendment that he's dropped pH two units, or a unit and a half in two years. So that's a slow process of dropping pH with prilled sulfur. The enfuric acid effect, as I've seen it in uh, Brian Belcher's groves, can have a quite uh, immediate effect. In those cases where you have high bicarbonates and maybe not so high pH in the soil, you have a fairly quick
quick effects. So one is a more quick uh, effect on tree health appearance. The other is a more slow uh, change in pH and, and hopefully a, a, a following a change in, root, in tree health. Okay, so back to the uh, central uh, part of this talk was we were talking about Phytophthora. That was how it was uh, advertised. So what about Phytophthora and the recommendations? Uh, well, it's not just Phytophthora. It's Phytophthora and all the other pests and pathogens that affect roots. So it's nematodes, it's weevils, it's all the different types of nematodes. But basically, all those recommendations for management of those pests and pathogens is in the spray guide. I'm not going to repeat the exact details for all those, but I will talk about Phytophthora and what we recommend at this time. With Phytophthora, again, we use a threshold count that you can have uh, uh, performed by Syngenta or, or a commercial lab, and they'll give you a number, they'll give you a range. Uh, of, we have a range of the threshold that succeeded where you, where you consider treatment. And what we're recommending right now are four treatments and rotation of uh, a mefenoxum type material, type of uh, fungicide, and, a, and an alliate phosphite type of mode of action of fungicide, so that we're rotating uh, modes of action. We have only two, so that's a pretty straightforward recommendation. And what I'd like to bring to your attention is the order of business here in terms of which goes first and second and, and how they come in, in order, is that after spring flush, you treat with a alliette phosphite type activity. Uh, 45 days later, a methanoxin type activity. Uh, again, 45 days after that, alliette phosphite type activity. And then you end with that fall flush. After the shoot flush, you have a fall flush of roots by uh, methanoxin uh, injection. And we recommend injection over broadcast of, of methanoxin. Uh, so final recommendations are this. Uh, matching nutritional s supply with nutritional demand is, is basic principles in terms of your nutritional program. Same goes for water. Uh, you balance the costs that I'm talking about here of managing some other things that I brought into play that is uh, managing pH, managing uh, water, uh, conditioning water, managing water quality. Uh, you, you balance those costs that I've added here, the Phytophthora management costs, with those that you have already invested in all the other things. So you have to, uh, you have, to uh, have some trade-offs here in your program. You can't pay for everything uh, in the world. So what can you do with regard to uh, addressing this issue that I've raised today is that you can check the pH of the wetted zone and get a soil pH uh, reading on your, your growth and, and go back and review your dolomite history. You can test the well water for pH by carbonate, salinity, and so forth. All those numbers that you're getting in that report are important to help you interpret where you are with your water quality. We're currently investigating what this water quality issue, what this soil pH issue is all about in terms of just how much stress does bicarbonate create for a root system. And how is that stress in, expressed? Is it expressed as just a disruption of nutrient uptake, or is it expressed as more than that? Is it expressed as an effect on water uptake as well? And we're doing this research uh, in collaboration with, uh, again, Brian Belcher and uh, Davis Management, and we're doing this in cooperation with uh, uh, Kelly Morgan, who'll be talking more about these issues in his talk. So some acknowledgments here are my lab, of course, and I want to uh, emphasize the, the, the contributions of Evan Johnson on looking at root infection and that process and bringing it really to light that uh, this is really not anything like we expected. Uh, at CREC, Diane Acor did the work on root plugging. It revealed that roots don't get as plugged as they do uh, in shoots, as shoots get plugged. Our cooperators, Mike Irie uh, from Southern Gardens and Brian Belcher, again from Bayless Management, uh, have brought a lot of things to our attention, grower observations that are important to uh, forward forwarding our interpretation of things. And then the root health surveys that I did in all these different locations over time to show that this root loss is really not just uh, here and there. It's, it's regional, and it's, it's just part and parcel to the effect of HLB damage on trees. So with that, I'll uh, close and take questions if there's time. Thank you.